This video was produced by the Top Cut. Be sure to check out thetopcut.net. Your home for Pokemon TCG tournament coverage, professional game analysis, and interviews with the best players in the world. Thanks for watching. Hello everybody, it is Tuesday, January 31st. We are in the year 2012. That means it is another week of a Tuesday tutorial. It should be episode number 8 if I can count correctly. And that means I actually made it 8 weeks doing this. <laughs> So, going to try to do this every week. Struggle to come up with topics sometimes, but this week we have a pretty neat topic, which is all about rogue decks. Now, this could be a pretty touchy subject for people. Uh, might offend some people, might open some people's eyes, but this will be all about rogue decks, what it means to play rogue, what you should do if you want to play a rogue deck, and what you should not do. So, I have been in a slideshow sort of mood. You know, last week we did the thing about statistics and all that. So, I made another slideshow. And, let's see, let us switch to that. Yeah, there we go. So, going rogue. Of course, we have Mr. Tyrogue there. I could not think of anything more clever than that. <laughs> uh, so, there's Tyrogue. And we are just going to get right into it, I guess. So, what is a rogue deck? Well, plain and simple, it's not one of the popular decks. It's uh, usually a little unusual, or it contains some cards that are rarely seen, you know, or some combination of cards that you don't usually see. It's just kind of out of the ordinary. Not a normal deck, an attempt to be creative. Uh, it attempts to surprise people with a brand new strategy. Uh, just something wacky sometimes or it can just be something that nobody's thought of before and normally when you play a rogue deck you're trying to counter the established decks the archetypes so in general a rogue deck the concept of a rogue deck kind of encompasses all these things it's usually not popular you don't really see it before it's kind of new and creative and uh, tries to take advantage of a surprise factor and tries to beat the top decks at the time so, now that we know what a rogue deck is, let's see. Let's look at what a successful rogue deck would contain. Uh, for the most part, it would beat the popular archetypes. Uh, but at the same time, you would want to beat other decks. You know, let's say people are playing nothing but Typhlosion Reshiram, and uh, your deck destroys Typhlosion Reshiram. And uh, you're you're thinking, all right, I got a deck that beats the popular deck, so I'm gonna play my rogue deck. But then you can't beat anything else, and then you run into the people that are not playing Typhlosion Reshiram. Then you probably don't have a very good deck. You know, you might be able to beat one thing, but you should still be able to beat the other thing. Uh, this is what makes a rogue deck successful. Still, usually it has some sort of surprise factor, and then that means that nobody will tech for it. But then at the heart of it, you do have a solid overall deck concept. So when people make rogue decks, a lot of the times they kind of think uh, they can just beat the popular decks, and that will make it a good rogue deck. But over the course of time, we've seen the successful rogue decks actually be the ones that are just kind of solid ideas that nobody really thought of before. So let's take a look at what those have been over the years. There really haven't been that many and we'll see sort of common themes among them so let's take a look at that of course the first real successful rogue deck came in 2004 which was the team magma deck uh, at the time everybody was playing nothing but their blaziken decks and uh, we were trying to counter blaziken then we had gardevoir then we had uh, wall rain come out to beat blaziken and all these decks but then the Japanese players came over with their silly magma Pokemon. And I remember we were all sitting there laughing. Why are they trading for all these magma Pokemon? These things are silly. They don't do anything. They're just a bunch of dumb Pokemon. I don't even look at Groudon's Pokebody. Uh, you have to have at least four magma Pokemon in play to use an attack even? That's terrible. 
But then they ended up winning every single division at Worlds in 2004. So we look kind of dumb. <laughs> so when you look at it, it has a lot of quick, hard-hitting basics. Like Team Magma Zangus uh, has a nice call for family attack. And then it also has team play, which at the time, 60 for 3 was pretty solid. I mean, not the greatest, but for a basic, that was pretty tough. And then you have the big hitter, Team Magmas Groudon. Uh, Pulverize did 50, but if they already had 20 on it, it would do uh, 70. Could also take advantage of Dark Energy, because it was a Dark type. And uh, 100 HP on a basic, that was pretty buff at the time. Nowadays, we have stuff like Reshiram. And uh, <laughs> those brand new EXs that came out with 180 hit points. But, believe me, at the time, 100 hit points for a basic was really strong. And uh, these Pokemon were really tough together. They were quick, they were hard hitting, they had energy acceleration, uh, they had a lot of type coverage, and it was very, very consistent. Now, the energy acceleration came from uh, Team Magma's Claydol and Team Magma's Camerupt, uh, which also were featured in the deck. But overall, this is just something nobody thought of. Uh, we were all caught up in Blaziken. Oh, Firestarter, you do a bunch of big damage. And uh, Gardevoir, same concept, energy acceleration, big damage, kill your opponent. But nobody thought of this very simple concept of using nothing but Team Magma's Pokemon and uh, just kind of pummeling your opponent with Groudon over and over. And then when it would get hurt, you would play a Mr. Briny's Compassion and scoop him up. And then you would attack with another Groudon. And you would just kind of win by being more consistent and faster. And that was really it. And that really won all three divisions in Worlds. Now it's something just nobody thought of before. And this is the first real rogue deck that really took the game by storm. Um, it was just kind of an eye-opener, you know. We thought we had everything figured out, but then we didn't even see this obviously super strong deck right in front of us. So this is one example of when a rogue deck can be very good. Um, it's just a very solid concept. The deck on its own is just strong. It didn't have to really counter anything. It was just a good, good deck that people discovered. And most people didn't realize it existed. But then when somebody finally stumbled onto this combination of cards, a good deck was born. And it took over worlds. So there is one example of a great deck that nobody really thought of was a rogue deck at the time. So, we move on to the next year of Worlds. You know, after 2004, we started looking for more road decks, and we thought we'd have everything figured out again. And then we had a group of people come up with this new deck, Nitto Queen, which once again took Worlds by storm. Um, only in the Masters Division, though, this time. The first year of Worlds, Team Magma actually won in Masters, Seniors, and Juniors. So, um, Nitto Queen was only in Masters. It did take first and third, though. It was a group of players, I believe it was Adam Capriola, Pablo Meza, who took third, and then Jeremy Marin, who ended up winning Worlds in 2005. Uh, I'm not sure if there's anyone else in that group. I can't really remember. But, um, yeah, this was just another deck that came out of nowhere. We thought we had everything figured out. We thought we had the Rock Locks, the Metacham EX, we had... Ludicolo, Macargo, we had everything figured out. And then this simple deck, it was just Nidoqueen and Pidgeot, and then a 1-1 Melodic line to heal damage off. And that was it. And this ended up dominating Worlds. So once again, this was a good example of a rogue deck. It had, um, I mean, when you look back at it, it was pretty obvious. I mean, it had a great type. There were absolutely no grass Pokemon played anymore. Uh, so its weakness was pretty much non-existent, non-existent, and uh, it had good matchups against all the archetypes. Toxic was a very good attack, you know, it's a double poison every turn. Power Lariat was a solid attack with double rainbow energy. And for the time, Nidoqueen Queen had high hit points and had strong, cheap attacks. And once again, this was just a strong deck on its own. It wasn't trying to really counter anything. It did happen to beat the popular decks, but that wasn't its goal. 
the goal was just to be a good deck, and it was. Um, it was a fairly consistent deck. Simple, straightforward. It was like an archetype. Just nobody had found it before. So, common theme we have so far is that the best rogue decks are actually just kind of archetypes that nobody found. Um, it was just a couple people stumbling onto a combination of cards that made a very good deck and nobody else really noticed before. Maybe everybody else got caught up with perfecting the archetypes we already had, or maybe just nobody bothered to look at these cards. But either way, Nidoqueen Queen and Team Magma were the two biggest examples of rogue decks that were really just archetypes nobody had found coming onto the scene and dominating a tournament. So, in that regard, you can see how powerful a rogue deck can be. Two years in a row, the world champion played a rogue deck that nobody had really seen before. So, this is just an example of how strong a rogue deck can be and what kind of an impact it can have on a tournament and what kind of success it can give you. But uh, as you'll see later, there are some limits to what you can do with rogue decks. But let's move on to more examples of rogue decks throughout Pokemon's history. After Nidoqueen, we thought, okay, nobody's ever going to come up with anything ever again. We're going to check everything this time. And then at U.S. Nationals the following year, this deck came out of nowhere. Uh, now, I actually was the one who worked on this deck. Uh, it was the Raichu Exeggutor deck that focused on you could either spread damage or you could be aggressive. Uh, Zap would hit everything with a Poke Power or a Poke Body. You would spread damage that way. And then when they knocked out your Raichu, you would have Scramble Energy to use Split Bomb and spread more damage. Or you could be aggressive with Delta Circle or Metallic Thunder. So, really, this is just another concept where it was consistent, it was quick hitting, and nobody really figured it out before. Uh, everybody was too caught up in their big EXs. This is when Blastoise EX, Lugia EX, the Steelix EX were the big ones. Uh, and pretty much EXs dominated everything. But this was the first one where it was really the surprise factor that made it so successful. So in, in 2006, this deck actually took first and second at U.S. Nationals. Something that really will never be done again. And Martin Moreno, he was the undefeated U.S. National Champion that year. And then Eric Anacenti took second. They went to a sudden death game three final, a mirror match. So, overall in the event, you have to understand that in this giant event that is U.S. Nationals, there were, I think, four people, maybe five, that played this deck. And two of them ended up in the finals out of hundreds and hundreds of people. Two out of hundreds of people. Only five were playing the deck. And this, they met up in the finals, first and second place. So that speaks to how powerful rogue decks can be. How powerful a brand new idea can be. How much success it can bring you. And how much surprise factor really does uh, come into play when you're at these big tournaments. So if you can come up with a very good rogue deck... You have a good shot of surprising a lot of people and making your way deep into these large tournaments. And we'll find one more example of, the, of this with this past year of Worlds, which was Ross Cawthon's deck known as The Truth. Uh, it was good against the metagame. Uh, nobody was really prepared for it. And then once it got set up, it just created this lock that nobody could get around. You know, you had the Vile Plume to lock trainers. You had the Reuniclus to swap damage, and, well, once it got set up, it just kind of beat everything. Now, I do feel that out of all of the successful decks that have been rogue over the years, this was the most fragile one, because it actually wasn't as good against the metagame as it seemed. Um, you know, this deck was very good against Typhlosion Reshiram. Once you got set up, the game was over. Nothing the Typhlosion deck could do. But uh, it actually had a very shaky matchup against the other popular deck in the format, which was uh, Yon Mega Magnezone. And um, just goes to show, even though you could have a very strong rogue deck, that uh, you do kind of need to get lucky still along the way. You know, he faced Sammy Sakum in the top 16 of Worlds and uh, kind of escaped with a victory. Sammy misplayed to lose 
So um, Ross kind of scraped by there, and then he faced a bunch of Typhlosions, I think. So um, even though you can have this great concept, you still do have to get lucky at tournaments. But once again, we showed the strength of the Rogue deck. What can happen when somebody figures out this combination of truly strong cards and builds a new archetype just because nobody's thought of it before? But this brings me to the whole point of this. So when we have the Rogue deck, people like to consider themselves maybe different. Um just because they play rogue decks. And this brings me to a famous book that's probably been brought up many, many times when we discuss competition. Um, and it is titled Playing to Win by David Serlin. If you haven't read it, I would definitely recommend checking this out. And in this book, he categorizes three different types of competitors. First, we have the scrub. And he just never really improves. Um, he's stuck in his own little world. He makes his own boundaries for himself, and he doesn't really get better. So, the second tier of players is the faux pro. He might be kind of good, might have some success, but then when he starts losing, he always just kind of finds an excuse as to why he didn't win, and never really improves to become the professional who is able to adapt and win, um, to kind of just keep improving and keeps winning, always finds a way to win. Now before I go on, I just want to mention there have been more rogue decks over the years, but I think the ones I listed were really the ones that had the most impact on the game. Uh, I can remember off the top of my head uh, a couple other rogue decks that did do well over the course of some seasons. You know, Jimmy Ballard is known for his rogue decks. Um, he had his Evolutions deck back in 2006 where he took second place at Worlds. I think that was a good example of a rogue deck that was just kind of a solid deck overall. Uh, then he had his Destiny deck in 2007, which I think was a little weaker. Um, had some success. Not great success, though. Never really did well at the national or world level. Um, then also Gyarados back in 2009. That was a rogue deck that I believe took top 8 at Worlds in 2009. Uh, but these decks... They did impact things, they were great decks, but the ones I listed were the ones that were really at the top of the list, you know, they had a huge impact, they won huge events, so I just wanted to gloss over those. There have been more rogue attempts over the year, but trust me, for every rogue deck that has succeeded, there are hundreds that have failed miserably, which is why I'm getting in to this next part. So, we're going to come back to this. And first, we'll talk about the scrub mentality. So, what exactly is a scrub? It is someone who says stuff like this. Net deckers are cheaters. You know, you all you do is go online and you copy a deck list, and that's not fair. You guys are cheaters. I am above that. Or, I lost, but at least I didn't play an archetype. I still have my dignity. I played my own deck. Or, uh, I'm not going to use this card because it's cheap. You know, it's not fair. Uh, Pokemon Catcher is too strong, so I'm not going to use it. Vileplume is cheap because it shuts off your trainer, so I'm not going to use it. These are all attributes of the scrub. Um, you know, you make up excuses, and you make up your own rules that really aren't in the game. Um, you kind of put walls in front of you for no reason. And handicap yourself from winning. Or it's someone who just plays for fun. But the bottom line is the scrub never improves because his or her mentality is just this. Um, that there are cheap things that I am too big for. Um, you know, I'm above these sort of things. And uh, I'm going to play my own deck. And this is where... You can relate rogue to the scrub thing. Some people take it too far. Uh, you say, I'm never going to play an archetype because I have I have dignity and pride. I'm going to build my own deck and I'll show you guys. Once I finally win, then I'll show you who's the best. And then what happens? Uh, this person refuses to play archetypes, keeps building their own deck, keeps trying wacky stuff, and probably never wins. 
There are exceptions to this, but for the most part, uh, the people who are ag against net decking and that sort of thing are usually going to fall in this category. The scrub category where you are just putting hurdles in front of yourself for no reason. You know, things that are perfectly legal in the game. I think <laughs> the big example of this lately has been uh, the big threat on Poke Gym that was Durant is against the spirit of the game. Um, no, it's not. It's part of the game. And if you choose to make excuses and ignore that this card is a part of the game, then you are just handicapping yourself. So, that is what we talk about when we mean the scrub mentality. And you do not want to be in this category. <clears throat> now, the next one is the faux pro. Now, this is somebody who has some success but he never really reaches the next level. Um, you know, maybe he'll win a tournament every once in a while, but he's not really on the same level as the professionals. Now, you'll blame your failures on things like, oh, I just keep getting unlucky and drawing bad hands. It wasn't my fault. You know, it's stupid. Uh, I'll get it next time. It clearly wasn't my fault. Um, it was It was just, you know, I flipped the tails when, when I shouldn't have, or uh, I didn't top deck... This person just keeps making excuses. They're never really able to improve because they can't recognize their own mistakes. And uh, they just keep making excuses over and over. And they think they're a pro. But really, they're not that good. Um, you know, you might see this person win a tournament every once in a while. But when it comes down to it, they are not a professional. They are not on that top level. And it's because they just keep making excuses. They don't analyze their own mistakes. And honestly, this is probably the most dangerous spot you could be in. Um, you know, nobody wants to be the scrub, but the faux pro is actually pretty dangerous because you think you're doing everything right. You think you're a professional, uh, and you think that the world's just against you when you lose, and it's never your fault. No, no. You couldn't make a mistake. No, you're a professional. How could you do that? When in reality, uh, you might not be as good as you think, but you're just not taking the time to analyze your mistakes. You're not taking the time to think about, well, maybe I lost the game because it was my fault. Maybe I did something wrong. No, you always blame it on outside factors. And uh, this is a very dangerous spot to be in. Hopefully none of you are this, but I've seen plenty of people who do this throughout the years. And uh, this is probably where most people get stuck, to be honest. Um... They really just don't take the time to look at it, and they get stuck in this middle tier where they can never really break out and become one of the top players. And uh, it's kind of sad, but it happens. So definitely take the time to analyze, look back at your games, and uh, stuff like that. So you can actually improve and get better. Always keep your mind open, otherwise you'll get stuck in this faux pro area where you're not really a professional, but you think you are. And that's just a spot you do not want to be in. <clears throat> and then we get to the professional. Now, the, the attributes of a professional, you know, you never rule anything out. You'll use any tool in order to win. You know, you don't set up fake boundaries for yourself like stuff is cheap. No. You analyze everything that's in the game and you just do what you need to do in order to win. You're able to recognize your own mistakes. You can improve. You can think outside the box. You're always aiming to get better, you're never content, you always want to improve, and you just play to win. Pretty simple, but yet, a lot of people don't really understand these things. Um, so you just kind of always want to improve. And this is the biggest thing that's wrong with people. Um, they think this is the faux pro thing, where you think you're already very good. You think, no, I don't need to get any better. I don't need to improve. I'm I'm the best. I, I've won a tournament before. You don't have to tell me uh, I'm good. But um, there is no real skill ceiling when you're playing any sort of game. You can always improve. You can always get better. Something can always improve. And you have to always strive to get better. Uh, whether that's practicing, going back and watching your games, analyzing what happens... Uh, whatever it takes, there's always a way you can improve. You can always tweak your deck list a little better. You can always put a little more work into it. So the professional 
always, always wants to improve what he can do and get better. So don't limit yourself. Don't think, I'm already good. I don't need to practice anymore. No. In everything, in every game, no matter what it is, you can always get better. So don't just be content. And that is kind of the lesson here. So, now we're going to get into some bad reasons to play rogue decks. And here I have the ever so fancy High Dragon. Look at him. He does 60 damage, and he can do 40 damage to two of your opponent's bench Pokemon. That's ridiculous. But what you don't realize is he's a stage 2. He costs 4 energy to attack, and he's weak to a popular type. So, um, <laughs> so a bad reason to play a rogue deck is when you say, oh, archetypes aren't creative, they're boring. Uh, I don't want to use these cheap cards. Or uh, your rogue deck has a really flashy combo or it does a lot of damage. Um, that's not a good reason to play a rogue deck. And yeah, just the main reason not to play a rogue deck. Um, I mean, the worst reason to play a rogue deck is when you say, Oh, well, I'm above that. I don't need to play these archetypes. I'm going to be the creative one. I'm going to be better than everybody else. I'll show everybody else who the real deck builder is, and I'll build my own deck. However, a good reason to play a rogue deck would be you just came up with a solid deck that nobody really figured out yet. Um, another good reason is once you have this solid deck, you have the surprise factor. Uh, you are able to win games just because nobody knows what your deck does. Uh, your deck has good matchups against the popular archetypes, and it's still a solid deck on its own. And it wins a lot when you test. So these are some good reasons to play a rogue deck. Not the other stuff where you're just playing it to play rogue. <laughs> um, so let's move on to this. There is a reason that archetypes win. There's a reason that archetypes are popular. And that is because they win. They are solid concepts. They are consistent. They aren't fancy. They just get the job done. Even though they can be repetitive and boring, and our example here is Mr. Durant, uh, you know, when you just devour over and over and over, it's not always fun, but you win. Um, this is why archetypes are played. They win. So, just remember, the next time you rag on an archetype, just remember, somebody had to think of it first, and um, there was a reason it kept getting played. And there's a reason why it keeps winning. So if you're against archetypes, question why you're against the archetypes. Because really it's tough to find a legitimate reason. Um, the one legitimate reason I can find for not wanting to play an archetype is that you want to avoid mirror matches. Uh, because for the most part mirror matches are not very skill based you know there's not a whole lot of control you can have um, sometimes this goes into my decision like if uh, Typhlosion Reshiram we'll use that as an example or even Durant if that's gonna be the big popular deck in your area you don't want to play that deck because you're just afraid oh it just depends on who gets a better hand and there's no real skill involved so that could be your one reason for not wanting to play a certain archetype uh, you just don't want to play a mirror match because for the most part, mirror matches are boring and straightforward and very luck-based. So I just wanted to clarify that as well. So, let's just clarify here. There's Rogue, and then there's Tech. Now, a Tech card is just something, maybe like one or two copies of a card, that you add into your deck in order to improve a certain matchup. My example here would be a Terrakian. If your deck is poor against uh, Magnazone maybe, or uh, any anything weak to fighting, you can add in this Terrakian, he can retaliate and knock out lightning Pokemon with ease, and you can add that into your deck just to improve a matchup against something. And uh, tech can be just as powerful as a rogue deck. You know, single copies of cards can be so strong. Stuff like Terrakian, um, you know, maybe you add uh, tech Shaman into your deck for some reason, or uh, even trainers like Lost Remover, those can be big. So there's a big difference against uh, between tech cards and an entire rogue deck. Tech cards can still be fit into archetypes. You can still give them your own creative spin. 
uh, just by adding a couple tech cards that differentiate you from the rest of the field. So you can still be creative while you're playing these archetypes, but there's a big difference between teching and playing a completely rogue deck. So we're just going to wrap it up. Archetype versus rogue, uh, when you're trying to decide what you want to play, play what gives you the best chance to win, because at the end of the day, when you're a competitive player, winning is the most important part. Uh, it doesn't matter how you win, unless you're cheating. <laughs> uh, it just matters that you win. So, if you're going to play a rogue deck, make sure it's been tested. Make sure it, it makes sense. Uh, sometimes you can look at a deck and just, even though you've won a bunch of games, you can just kind of look at it and say, okay, I don't think I actually should have been winning games with this. Maybe something's wrong. So use common sense, use good judgment. Uh, and don't play rogue decks just for the sake of playing rogue decks. Keep your options open, and again, a win is a win, it doesn't matter what deck you're using. Nobody really cares whether or not you won worlds with a rogue deck, or whether or not you won worlds with an archetype. At the end of the day, if you won worlds, you won worlds. Congratulations. Uh, people just remember that you won. Now, um, one thing I want to clarify is if, if you're playing just for fun, then this really doesn't apply. Uh, I assume most people that are watching this are playing to win, though. They're playing to be competitive. They're playing to win tournaments. So, when you're doing that, then that's when this applies. But if you're just like a parent who just shows up with their kid, and you just want to play for fun, sure, you can play what you want. It's not a big deal. But if you're trying to really win, don't let these boundaries, these, uh, these assumptions about um, rogue versus archetype, that shouldn't stop you from using something, that shouldn't make you use something. These are all just words and barriers that you set up for yourself. And really all they can do is hurt you. Keep your mind open to this kind of stuff. And uh, don't rule anything out. So uh, I just want to wrap it up with some articles to read. First one is Alex Brasso's Boring Can Be Better. Uh, I know you probably can't really copy the link off of this. But um, search for it on PokeGym, I guess. <laughs> um, boring Can Be Better. It's uh, an article that Big Chuck 01 wrote a while ago, and um, it was just about how the most successful decks over the year have just been the most straightforward, boring decks possible. Like in 2008, the Gardevoir Gallade deck that just used Psychic Lock over and over and over. Yeah, it was boring, but it won. And um, that was just kind of the point of the article. So check that out. Really interesting read. And also... As I've been saying, it's David Serlin's Playing to Win. The book is actually free online if you want to take a look at it. Go to that, that website, serlin.net, and you can check that out. So those are just some stuff to check out as well. So, hopefully you learned a little bit of something there. Um, our talk about rogue decks. Hopefully I never have to say the word rogue for a while, or archetype for a while, because those are all just silly, silly names. They really shouldn't be there in the first place. They're really just handicaps to yourself if you use them. So, that will be the end of the show. Thanks for watching.